Some psychological research suggests that certain criminals have problems with the way they think. In fact, one theory suggests they struggle to accurately read the expressions on people's faces. So how about you? Take a look at these faces. Which ones show anger? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're going to explore cognitive explanations of criminal behavior, which focuses on our internal mental processes, on the way we think. This is going to include, firstly, an exploration of two cognitive distortions, and secondly, a theory into levels of moral reasoning. First up, cognitive distortions. These are biased ways of thinking that offenders use to justify their criminal behavior. One cognitive distortion is called hostile attribution bias. This happens when an offender misinterprets social cues as hostile or threatening when they're not. For example, imagine someone accidentally bumping into a person as they walk along a corridor. If that person has hostile attribution bias, they might wrongly assume that they did it on purpose to provoke them. In other words, offenders with hostile attribution bias often believe their violent or aggressive behaviour was caused by someone else's actions. Instead of feeling guilt or shame, they rationalise the offence by blaming the other person, and this helps them maintain a positive view of themselves. One study investigated the relationship between hostile attribution bias and violent behaviour. The study involved two groups, one consisting of individuals with a history of violent offences and a control group of non-violent individuals. The researchers show participants a series of emotionally ambiguous faces. These are facial expressions that were not clearly angry or threatening, and they asked them to identify the emotional state of the individuals in the images. What they found was that the violent offenders were significantly more likely to interpret these ambiguous facial expressions as hostile or threatening compared to the control group. This suggests that individuals with a history of violent behaviour are more prone to misinterpret neutral or ambiguous social cues as aggressive, which could trigger a violent response. And in case you're wondering which of the faces at the start that I showed you were angry, the answer was none of them. But did you see anger where there was none? Another cognitive distortion is called minimalization. This is where offenders downplay the seriousness of their actions. For example, an offender might suggest that the injuries they caused during an assault were mild, even if the victim was severely hurt. Well, why do they do this? Well, by minimizing the impact of their crime, once again, offenders reduce feelings of guilt. They convince themselves that what they did wasn't really that serious. And this belief in how trivial their offense was allows them to maintain a positive view of themselves. Research conducted by Barbary in 1991 studied male sexual offenders and interviewed them to explore how they explained or justified their actions. He specifically looked for cognitive distortions including denial, minimization and justification of their crimes. What they found was just that. Many offenders minimize the impact of their offenses by downplaying the harm they'd caused to the victim. For example, some offenders would claim that the victim was not seriously harmed or that the victim consented to the behavior, even in cases where consent was clearly not possible. Offenders often shifted blame away from themselves, either claiming that external factors such as being under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or even things like emotional stress, were responsible for their behaviour, or that the victim provoked the situation. However, while cognitive distortions help us understand how offenders justify their behaviour, they don't really explain the root cause of offending. Are these distortions learned through their upbringing, or is there something biological at play? The answer to this remains unclear. While minimalization can explain how offenders rationalise their crimes after the fact, it doesn't explain why the crime happened in the first place. In other words, cognitive distortions tell us how an offender thinks about their crime, but not what caused it. This suggests that we may need to look to alternative explanations, such as the role of genetics or Isaac's criminal personality, to explain why people commit crimes. 
Next, let's look at moral reasoning and how it links to offending behaviour. Lawrence Kohlberg was a psychologist who produced a theory of moral development. He was interested in how a child's understanding of right and wrong develops over time as they mature and develop. Kohlberg presented his participants with moral dilemmas and analysed their responses to determine the stage of moral reasoning they were at. His theory has three levels, each divided into two stages, reflecting different reasons behind moral choices. For Kohlberg, criminal behaviour relates to a lower level of moral reasoning, in other words, level 1 and stages 1 and 2. In other words, their decisions are based on avoiding punishment or gaining something in return. For stage 1, punishment, a person might refrain from stealing a car only because they fear getting caught and punished, not because they believe stealing is inherently wrong. However, if they think they can commit the crime without Without being caught, they may go ahead with it. For stage 2, reward, a person at this stage might decide to commit a crime such as stealing the car because they believe the financial gain outweighs the risks. The profit they will get from stealing it is worth it. They view morality in terms of what's in it for me. Supporting evidence for the role of moral reasoning in crime comes from Ashkar and Kenny in 2007. The study focused on two groups of adolescents, one consisting of young offenders and the other of non-offenders. They presented them with moral dilemmas similar to those used by Kohlberg and analysed their responses. They found that the young offenders were found to reason at lower levels of moral development compared to the non-offenders, and this was particularly the case for offenders who committed violent crimes crimes. In other words, most of the offenders reasoned in terms of self-interest, rather than concern for social rules or the rights of others. However, Kohlberg's theory of levels of moral reasoning has been criticised in several ways. Firstly, it can be criticised in a similar way to the cognitive distortions. While Kohlberg's theory explains how offenders reason and think, it doesn't explain why they develop this type of reasoning in the first place. Is it due to upbringing, life experience, experiences or something else. His theory is good at describing how offenders think, but not so good at explaining why. For that, we need to consider other explanations. Secondly, the way Kohlberg studied moral reasoning has been criticised. This is because he used moral dilemmas, which are hypothetical scenarios. Researchers often ask participants how they would respond in certain situations, but this doesn't reflect how offenders behave in real life high pressure circumstances. Therefore, it can be argued that Kohlberg's theory of offending may be limited because it's based on research that lacks ecological validity. Thirdly, Kohlberg's theory of moral reasoning has been criticised for being gender biased. For an explanation of that, including how a student he trained called Carol Gilligan critiqued him, you can check the video on gender bias linked above and in the description below. Finally, we can conclude our discussion on these cognitive explanations of offending by considering how these ideas can be used to deal with offending. Cognitive therapy helps offenders challenge and change their thinking, enabling offenders to understand on their thought processes is crucial for rehabilitation. If we can change how offenders think, helping them move beyond distorted thoughts and low-level moral reasoning, we may reduce the likelihood of re-offending. Next, we're going to shift the focus of explaining criminal behaviour to the unconscious mind. Could crime be due to the first two years of life and the attachment with your mother? Or is it because you have a part of your personality that is a bit inadequate? To watch that video, you can click on the screen now or in the link in the description. And for more resources related to psychology, check out the Bear It In Mind website. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.